my name is Melissa Evans and I'm a writer for both adults and children and my most recent children's book was Wedge Wabbit. I think what triggered Wedge Wabbit was um, I've been thinking for a long time about trying to do an updated version of The Secret Garden and thinking what that would mean in terms of story and I didn't get very far with that but what I did retain was the central relationship at the heart of the secret garden which is between a very independent feisty girl and uh, an unhappy nervy ill boy and I'm, I kept that relationship at the central of Wade Rabbit um, but I always try to write the books that I really enjoyed reading as a kid of which my inner 10 year old still enjoys and I always loved the contrast between um, being sensible and being silly. Uh, somebody very sensible trying to cope with extreme silliness has always appealed to me. And I love the idea of, of somebody very straightforward trying to organise a group of idiots, basically, which is what happens in Wed Rabbit. And I love that, the centre of it. But um, it, it's hard to say all the different inspirations. Perhaps there was a touch of Telly Tubbies, I don't know, in terms of the Wimsy Woos. Um, Perhaps the idea for Wed Wabbit himself come a long time ago. A, 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 a book for adults I wrote in about 2004 had a, a child talking about his toy called Wed Wabbit. There was nothing more, it's just a passing mention, but maybe it's been sitting in my head for that long. So the usual thing with my books is a whole load of different inspirations come together, but at the centre of it is that relationship from, from the Secret Garden. Oh, <laughs> because the whole um, the whole uh, centre of the story is how boring the Wimbly Woos book is. I mean, I read lots of picture books to my own children when they were young, and most of them, obviously, you're able to choose the books yourself as an adult. But as they get a little bit more articulate, they tend to get very firm opinions themselves. And occasionally they will fix on a book that perhaps you as an adult don't enjoy quite so much. And I remember one particular book, nothing like the Wimpy Woo book, but nevertheless a very repetitive book that I loathed so much that I, I hid it in the end because I couldn't bear reading it anymore. And I, I fear the Wimpy Woo would be very like that, something with a lot of rhymes and not much plot and a lot of silliness. <laughs> I don't mind silliness as long as it's funny, but silliness just for the sake of silliness is annoying. That's something I don't find hard, um, uh, funnily enough. Uh, although, once it started, I suddenly thought, oh my goodness, there is going to be so much rhyming in this book. And it was quite deliberate that I brought in more characters who didn't rhyme, because I had to have proper conversations in it. So I've got Dr. Carrot, and I've got Ella Elephant, and I've got the two, the two children. But also, I've got the king, who doesn't really rhyme. And, and, and that's that's enjoyable to write for somebody who's a bit tired of rhymes by that point. But I didn't actually find it difficult to think of the rhymes. What was difficult was to enable those rhymes to convey plot. And that, that is quite hard. So, um, but no, no, in terms of rhyming couplets, I'd probably go on forever, really. <laughs> Dr. Carrot came uh, from, for some reason, I had a toy when I was very little who again for some reason lived in my dad's toolbox in the garage, I've got no idea why, but it was a plastic carrot, it was a hollow plastic carrot, it was a big one that, that long, and we called it, she was called Mrs. Carrot, goodness knows where she came from, but that was in my head very much. Um, Ella, where did Ella come from? Well Ella's voice is very much based on someone I know, a friend of mine, someone that I love dearly, but that kind of flowing enthusiasm and joy comes from someone I know, you know. I had never read an audio book before, and I'm not an actor, I don't think you have an actor's voice, but I was very conscious that there are lots and lots and lots of jokes in Red Rabbit, lots of very precise jokes that I knew exactly how they had to be read in order for the jokes to work, and I couldn't bear the thought of <laughs> listening to an audio book with an actor getting the jokes wrong, because I don't tend to be invited to the audio book session, so I'm not there sort of pouncing on it even though I'm an ex-radio producer, you know, <laughs> you know, the author isn't really part of audio book sessions on the whole. 
and I just I just couldn't stand that these jokes that I take hours to think of and to get to get the rhythm of and to get the the, the, the emphasis and the speed of I couldn't bear the thought that those would be wrong. So I volunteered to do it and I had to do a voice test to make sure you know I had enough clarity in my voice to do it. And they agreed for me to do it. But then of course I was faced with the fact that there were about 30 different voices in it. So, and it was particularly difficult distinguishing the Wimbley Woos. So what I did, I got the voice right and then I would record a little bit on my phone so that when I came to specific Wimbleys, I, I would play, play it back on my phone to remind me of how the greys talked or, 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 or how, they, how their pigs talked or whatever. Um, and so that was really, that was, uh, it was difficult to be precise, but I had to do it, I had to distinguish them all. But Wed Wabbit was the most difficult because he, so loud and so screechy and I, 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 I my voice uh, fails quite quickly I've got voice you know I've got quite a high pitched voice and it means that um I, I can't talk for a long time or certainly shout for a long time without losing it and in the end we recorded all the wed wabbit bits right at the end um so so they I was able to maintain the volume but I was really hoarse afterwards for that day so uh, it was it was good fun I mean I loved doing it I was really proud to do it yeah Well, my tip, which always first, first of all, is, is read. The best way you can learn to write is to read a lot, but also to read um, quite critically and quite widely. So don't just stick to one author or one type of book. Read around, and, and even if that just means taking a book off the shelf and reading the first couple of pages or the first chapter just to see whether you like it. Because the more widely you read the more choices you will have about what you write and what you like about writing and also have a think about if you really love a book think about what you love about it what do you you know is it was it the character was it the humor was it the plot do you love the read was it the adventure and if you don't like a book have a think again about what why you don't like it is it because the plot didn't work properly or because the chapters were too long or do you thought the characters were silly Think, think about, think critically, think critically, read widely, and write what you like reading. That's what I say. <laughs> Far too difficult. <laughs> too many books I love. Um, and also, a lot of the books, of course, that I read as a kid um, aren't so well known now or, or, or um, haven't been published for a while. But the sort of books I like reading were the sort of books that I write. I, I loved um, ordinary children coming involved in magic. That's what I always loved. I loved children stumbling into adventure, stumbling into magic. So I could imagine that happening in my own life. So I wanted or, ordinary, ordinary worlds touching magic worlds. Rather than whole magic worlds like The Hobbit, I like, I like the two touching each other. So I used to love e, e. Nesbitt, who wrote um, the, the Phoenix and the Carpet and Five Children in It, which have both been made into great films. And again, you know, she's got very ordinary, argumentative families with siblings who are horrible to each other, but in a very funny and believable way, and who then have to cope with magic in their lives. And it's lovely. I, I really enjoy that. So that's my inspiration. Yeah. The characters always come first with me, uh, you know, and, and as you write a character, as you get to know a character, that uh, changes the way the plot works. Because if, if, you, if a character is really solid, then you can't impose, a, you can't attach the plot to them. They have to develop their own plot. So you have to really know your character inside out and know how they talk. And once you've got that, then the plot can develop in, a, in unexpected ways that still fit the character. I like to think that I'm a combination between uh, grey and pink, I should think. <laughs> very, very wise, but quite cheerful, you know. <laughs> also a touch of the king, really, a bit lazy sometimes as well. 